Uh, welcome to my talk on linguistic manifolds. Um, I titled the talk Linguistic Manifolds Topological Structure of Representation Spaces in Deep Neural Models of Natural Language Data. Um, this is a kind of new research project that I've been pursuing, so it's still in uh, early stages of development, but I have some <clears throat> interesting early results. Uh, before we dive into these topics, um, I will briefly introduce myself. My name is Stephen Fitz. Um, I studied for my undergraduate degree at Columbia University in New York, and for my graduate degrees at the University of Cambridge in the UK and University of Chicago in the USA. I'm currently a member of uh, the KO Global Research Institute in Tokyo, and I also teach courses at uh, KO University relating to artificial intelligence and programming and data science. Uh, my main field of research is uh, what's known uh, in the general public as deep learning. Uh, it is a subfield of machine learning uh, that came to prominence in, in recent years, um, and it's located in the broader area of artificial intelligence. But in uh, my particular view of this subject, uh, my particular approach to it, I view it as a subfield of representation learning. And this is really what uh, neural networks are very good at, is to derive uh, abstractions, hierarchical representations of raw inputs. Uh, the whole field emerged from early computational neuroscience uh, in the 50s, uh, actually originally from uh, work uh, of people like Pitts at the University of Chicago, where they tried to uh, develop computational models of uh, how animal brains uh, perform their operations. Uh, so the early success was uh, modeling of simple neurons with uh, linear algebra operations. Um, similarly to how airplanes are inspired, uh, at least initially, by uh, birds, um, <clears throat> artificial intelligence was inspired by early neuroscience and uh, psychology as well. Uh, however, modern airplanes like fighter jets are uh, much faster than birds and they can carry uh, large loads, and this is not due to copying of exact biology of bird, bird flight, uh, but uh, discovering the laws that govern flight, like laws of aerodynamics. Similarly, in uh, my field, uh, we try to study computational processes that lead to the emergence of intelligence, intelligent behavior. Uh, one of such processes is the abstraction discovery in uh, deep neural networks. So deep neural networks are uh, complex systems composed of many layers of neurons that communicate with each other. Uh, each subsequent uh, pair of layers uh, is a mapping between different vector spaces. So the entire neural network is a composite uh, function composed of many mappings through a sequence of vector spaces. Uh, the deeper layers tend to discover more abstract uh, representations of the uh, initial inputs that, that are fed to the network. Uh, the operation of those systems is based on uh, neural information processing. And the past uh, years of uh, connectionism and deep learning has been the study and design and study of different neural architectures. So in my work, uh, I build systems made of uh, convolutional layers, uh, recurrent neural networks, in particular gated architectures such as LSTM, uh, and uh, attention mechanisms. Especially the attention mechanisms came to prominence in the past two years, uh, leading to uh, deep language models like transformers based on the idea of self-attention. Uh, this is a quotation from a conversation I had with uh, Jeff Hinton, who's one of the uh, founders of deep learning. He, uh, he was one of the early researchers that came from originally from psychology and neuroscience and is the most prominent uh, researcher in, in, the, in the deep learning community. Uh, that was at the University of uh, Chicago uh, after a talk he gave. And this conversation inspired my pursuit of this uh, line of research that I will explain in this talk. Uh, he said, I think that people who assume thoughts are symbolic expressions made a huge mistake. What comes in is a string of words, and what comes out is a string of words. Because of that, strings of words were the obvious ways to represent things. And they thought that what goes on in between was some formal sequential language like a string of words. I think that 
<clears throat> what's between is nothing like a string of words. I believe that the idea that thoughts must be in some kind of language is as silly as the idea that understanding the layout of a spatial scene must be in pixels. However, what's in between isn't pixels or symbolic expressions. I think thoughts are those high dimensional vectors that have causal powers. They cause other vectors, which is utterly unlike the standard view involving symbolic calculi. <clears throat> so uh, he's basically uh, implying that we shouldn't view artificial intelligence as some kind of symbolic system like a formal language, uh, but more as a uh, manifold of neural activity. And those neural uh, communication that happens in neural networks define the thought process of a neural network. And it can be view, viewed as a point in some high dimensional vector space. So studying the structure of those vector spaces uh, is an important part of being able to understand how neural networks make decisions. Uh, another component of uh, the research I will present here is the view of learning as information compression. These are two different uh, descriptions of the solar system. One is that on the right is geocentrism, which prevailed in Europe for uh, a long time due to cultural reasons, uh, that puts Earth at the center of the system. And the other is heliocentric system, which puts the sun at the center. Uh, obviously, the heliocentric system is much simpler uh, as a model. So it, it's, it takes less bits of information to encode uh, the same data with the same accuracy. Uh, especially for language models, which is a field I'm, I work in, um, the state-of-the-art language models can have a more than 30 billion parameters. Uh, not only is that problematic in terms of training, because it's optimizing a function in a 30 billion dimensional vector space, uh, but those, la those language models are extremely powerful feature extractors that could be uh, used to enhance many applications on mobile devices, cell phones, and so on. However, due to their large size, uh, most people don't have access to these systems yet because they take too much uh, space and computational power to run. So finding a better parameterization of these language models uh, can allow us to compress them, and I'll talk about this later, uh, to obtain equivalent language models uh, with equivalent power, equivalent accuracy, uh, that take much less space and less energy to train. Uh, another view of this is that by reparametrizing the neural network connections, we can basically view the data from a different perspective. Um, we can think of the data as being something very high dimensional. Uh, however, the underlying principle that generated the data usually uh, is define, defines some manifold that's lower dimensional in that embedding space. Uh, by embedding it through a neural network, we kind of make up a series of projections onto different subspaces. Uh, and the way we view those projections is important to uh, understanding both the data and the model. So for example, this is a cartoon <clears throat> analogy because the systems that we work with are in very high dimensional vector spaces, uh, usually uh, hundreds, thousands, or even a billion dimensional vector space. But this is an, this is an example from a three dimensional vector space where you have a the two clusters of vectors, if you project them on one of the planes looking from above, they form two concentric circles. Um, being able to classify those two points, you would, to be able to classify them, you would need a model uh, that's composed of higher order polynomials because you, you would need a nonlinear surface uh, to separate these two classes of points. However, if you projected this on a different hyperplane, you would notice that uh, they can be separated with a simple linear model, which is a much lower uh, complexity model that runs faster and can be stored with less data. So this will be the, uh, the theme of the rest of the talk, is uh, trying to discover uh, structures in the embedding spaces of natural language uh, that allow you to discover the grammar of the language as a shape of some manifold. Uh, to do this, <clears throat> we will look at topological structure. Topological structure is uh, uh, a kind of um, structure coming from uh, mathematics, the study of manifolds, uh, where we look at different subsets of points and how they relate to each other. So um, it is, in a way, more general than uh, 
um, things we can write down as functions. Um, why would we want to study topological structure? Well, because by just looking at those projections, we are getting a kind of skewed vision of what's really happening. Uh, this is an artist installation uh, where you have a projection from uh, something that's in three dimensions onto a flat surface. So it's one view of the data. Uh, the actual shape is entirely different from what it looks like when you, uh, when you view it on a projection. A similar thing happens with language models that uh, live in a very high dimensional vector spaces. We're talking about hundreds of dimensions in a typical word embedding. Uh, then, therefore, projecting it on any lower dimensional spaces, you lose a lot of information. So we would like to access directly uh, the structure, the shape of those manifolds as they exist in those high dimensional vector spaces. Of course, we cannot imagine it uh, graphically like here. So we need some kind of tool to be able to extract information from that space and work with it on a computer. <clears throat> uh, fortunately, in mathematics, over the past century, people have been studying uh, uh, the idea of a manifold. And that's very uh, much in use in physics. Uh, the idea of a manifold is uh, maybe uh, too complex to explain fully in this talk. Uh, but you can think of it as some kind of structure that can be map in, mapped into uh, subspaces of Rn. Um, how does it relate to language? Well, the manifold hypothesis uh, says that data that comes from naturally occurring phenomena, uh, as encoded by a neural network in a vector space, uh, tends to uh, uh, distribute in neighborhoods, noisy neighborhoods, around some lower di dimensional submanifolds of that space. And the shape of those manifolds, the mathematical properties of these manifolds, uh, are dictated by two main factors. One is the choice of the, the model, the choice of the architecture used to derive the representations. So that would be the particular neural network used. Uh, but the other is the physical phenomenon, the physical laws governing the process that generated the data in the first place. So in terms of, uh, in, ca in the case of language, like natural languages, human languages, uh, that would be the grammar of the language, which is further dictated by other factors like human experience, psychology, and uh, even physical properties of um, human species. Um, to study these manifolds directly is still a hard thing. So we need something that can be uh, written down and uh, work and process on a computer. In order to do this, uh, we will derive invariance of shape. So instead of studying the shape uh, directly, we will map it into some combinatorial structures that we can work with on a computer. And those structures will be uh, the structures coming from equivalent shapes, and equivalence here means uh, homeomorphism, uh, will have isomorphic structures. Uh, so there is a, a, a whole um, area of methods already developed for the study of such manifolds in pure mathematics. And it's not really studied by computer scientists uh, or people in the physical sciences as much. Uh, I think mainly because of the gap of communication. There's often, um, there are often um, uh, discoveries made on the bridge between two different areas when people don't communicate with each other. And I think this is one of these areas that's not um, uh, exposed enough to people from different branches of, of science. Um, so this was developed um, uh, for the study of very complex abstract manifolds in mathematics in particular to classify the types of manifolds that, that can exist in different dimensions. Um, it was uh, introduced by uh, uh, Eilenberg and McLean uh, several decades ago at the University of Chicago and Columbia University. Um, and uh, it's, it falls under the general umbrella of category theory. So category theory allows you to translate problems from one branch of mathematics into a different branch of mathematics and solve them there. And then kind of you could take the solution from the other branch of mathematics and translate it back into, the, into your field. Uh, in particular, we are interested in uh, taking something like a manifold, a topological problem, and translating it into a 
uh, algebraic structures like rings, groups, and modules. Uh, to do this, we have to put some manifold structure uh, on our space. Uh, one such uh, theory is the idea of a cell complex. So uh, we can build up spaces from different dimensional cells. In this example, uh, this is a torus. It's, it has a cavity in the middle, it's just a surface. And um, it has two holes. It has one hole that goes through it, and there's another uh, two-dimensional hole inside of it, is the cavity inside the torus. So you can decompose it, you can give it a cell structure by decomposing it into three types of cells. Uh, you have this point here, which is a zero-dimensional cell. You have these loops, which are one-dimensional cells. There are two independent loops, one that goes around the torus and one that goes through a hole. And there's the surface of the torus, which is a two-dimensional cell. Now, having this kind of structure on a space, we can uh, apply hom homotopy and homology theories to translate it into a sequence of uh, vector spaces and uh, modules. Um, and in general, different algebraic structures and like groups. So um, the most uh, powerful of these invariants that's, that's used uh, in mathematics is the homotopy theory. Homotopy theory looks at uh, different loops in a space. And by loops, we mean general loops in higher dimensions as well. So a point is a zero-dimensional loop. Uh, this kind of regular loop is a one-dimensional loop. And the cavity inside the torus will be a two-dimensional loop. And there are higher dimensional loops, which are maps from SN and dimensional ball to the sphere to the space. However, this theory, um, this theory is powerful, but it's, uh, it has very high computational complexity. And um, the groups that we um, obtain from it, called the homotopy groups, are often very complex and uh, non-commutative. Uh, therefore, um, a simpler theory is being used often. Uh, simpler in the sense that it can be uh, computed using combinatorial methods, but it loses some information. Uh, this theory is more abstract to define, but it's something we can work on, uh, with on a computer. Uh, that, and that's the homology theory. Homology theory basically looks at different types of cavities in a space and uh, derives a sequence of, of abelian groups corresponding to these cavities. And uh, then we can look at the rank of these groups, which gives us a sequence of integers describing the shape of the space. Uh, so now the manifold hypothesis says, if I have uh, some natural phenomenon, there will be submanifolds of that uh, embedding uh, that describe the, the principles that generated the phenomenon. Um, so <clears throat> to do that, the first approach we take um, will be uh, to compute uh, what's called the Betty numbers. So Betty numbers uh, basically count different cavities in a space, and they count them using the homology groups. Uh, like, for example, for a point, the first, the zeroth Betty number will be the number of connected components. Then the first Betty number will be the number of uh, loops that cannot be contracted. And then higher Betty numbers count the, the independent uh, generators for higher cavities. Um, to do this on a machine, uh, we first impose a combinatorial structure on a space and uh, derive what's called a topological persistence. Topological persistence uh, basically creates a, a whole sequence of um, uh, cell complex, com complexes. Um, there are different types of complexes you can create um, over different scales. And that's called a filtration. So you grow um, uh, neighborhoods around each point, And when the neighborhoods intersect, you add a cell uh, of, of different dimensions, depending on how many of them intersect. Then you record these, uh, the appearance and disappearance of different topological features in different dimensions. And you get this kind of barcode. Uh, and this barcode basically uh, encodes topological features of that space. So it encodes the, the shape of that space. Now, my particular field is computational linguistics. So um, computational linguistics as <clears throat> is studied in the modern days, uh, especially the past two years, uh, was a golden kind of age of uh, natural language processing due to transformer-based architectures in uh, deep learning uh, is based on uh, embedding natural language data into high-dimensional vector spaces and then using those representations to obtain uh, different 
to make predictions or to uh, generate to learn to generate language uh, um, to extract different kind of linguistic features from the language as well. Uh, on the base level of all these uh, applications is the idea of language modeling. Um, and this is a quotation from Chomsky uh, in his early papers. Uh, he said, in order for linguistics to be a science, linguists have to develop a formal theory which can characterize all and only those utterances which belong to a language. Furthermore, we need to make clear how the choice of a theory relates to linguistic evidence, in other words, data. Uh, so in my work, uh, theory will be a deep neural language model, which is basically a neural network that can uh, classify sequences of words coming from a language by assigning them high probability. And the data itself uh, that's used to validate the theory will be a raw corpus of unannotated natural language data. So basically a, a Wikipedia feed or a, a social media feeds or uh, just any text written in that language without any annotation. Um, so the past two years uh, brought us a revolution in natural language processing uh, due to uh, adoption of uh, advanced uh, deep neural network architectures. And this progress in NLP over the past year and a half especially uh, resembles what happened in computer vision uh, several years ago, uh, over the past decade. And the general trend will be that uh, in early days, and early days I mean this field moves very fast, so early days will be 2013. Uh, Around 2013, 2014, people used uh, globally pre-trained uh, representations for natural language, such as word to vec GLOV, basically a vec vec ve shallow vector space embeddings of natural language data. Uh, now, the next step, the same as in vision, you go into a deeper hierarch hierarchical representations of the same data, and you progress from shallow pre-training to entire language models that derive features of abstract features of the data. Um, so the main lesson from the past two years is that instead of just using pre-trained word representations, we train entire language models and the state vectors in those language models give us a deeper representation of, of, the, of, of natural language text. <clears throat> and you can think of it, uh, for language it's harder to make similar visualizations, but this is a visualization from uh, computer vision, uh, in deep neural network, the early layers tend to uh, capture, the representations in the early layers uh, tend to capture um, functions of the pixels uh, that are kind of, you know, simple uh, uh, features like edges, things like that. And the deeper you go into the network, the more abstract shapes you can compose out of them, and eventually you get entire faces and uh, buildings and things like that. Similar in natural language, uh, today's models get very deep. So uh, they map language to a series of vector spaces, and each vector space will represent more abstract features of language. So the first uh, early layers might look at some basic syntactic uh, properties of the, of the input, and higher layers might look at more semantics and uh, even pragmatics of language use and uh, language grounding, like uh, abstract ideas about the things that are uh, transitional reasoning, things like that. Um, so it's a similar process. Um, this whole idea of language modeling is kind of inspired by uh, distributional semantics. So uh, this is a quotation from uh, a famous linguist. Uh, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. That means if I want to understand uh, the meaning of words, I can just look at how the words are used in context with other words around them. Um, <clears throat> so a language model will be just some deep neural network that takes in a string of words and computes the probability of that string under its model. Uh, normally people factor these probability distributions into uh, conditional probability distributions using the chain rule, and that allows us to generate words conditioned on some sequence of words. And the way to train such language models, there are different ways, but uh, the most obvious one is uh, you give it a sequence of words that came from a corpus, and you don't give it the following word, and then you ask the network to predict the following word. And then you score it based on the probability that it assigned to the word that was actually in the corpus. 
you can do it in both directions and usually people concatenate representations from both directions or you can do something like a masked language models model which is popular now where you take a sentence and you remove some of the words and you ask the model to fill in the blanks uh, another <clears throat> another um, way to train them which is something i looked into as well for this uh, for analyzing the shape of those faces is uh, the next sentence prediction so you give it two sentences from a let's say from a book that followed each other and you ask it to make a binary choice whether the sentence follows or is in the same document with the other sentence or not um, and you train it using this so that that allows it to understand more of the global document structure uh, popular ways of implementing the language models is uh, something like a recurrent language model, which is one of the experiments, uh, uh, a series of experiments that I did with it, um, where you take a sequence, you use a recurrent neural network to produce a state vector, and then you use the state vector to make a prediction. Um, a more interesting language model would be a transformer-based, where you feed it through a, se se a sequence of vector spaces that recompute the representation using self-attention, and you obtain a whole, uh, a whole filtration, a whole sequence of vector spaces for the language representation. Um, so now to the main topic of this talk and some results. Um, so I'm interested in what is the shape of those representations trained on those state-of-the-art language models on large quantities of data. Uh, so this is the uh, kind of summary of my method. Uh, we derive first some, uh, design some language models based on um, some axioms from uh, uh, connectionist theory and linguistics. They are deep neural architectures meant to model languages. We feed it corpus data, we train the language model, and we observe how the representations evolve over time and what is the final representation in the end. Then we apply homology theory from algebraic topology to compute algebraic invariance of those point clouds. And we use those algebraic invariance as features and uh, to further analysis. Um, so different languages um, ten, turns out have different shapes. The manifolds uh, resulting from those languages have different shapes. This is just a projection. Uh, and homology theory allows us to study the shape of those manifolds and uh, derive different uh, uh, features from those shapes. So some early results is that um, you can define, using something called relative homology, you can define the shape of words by basically taking the word out of the language and looking at the language without that word uh, and deriving the manifold uh, as if that word didn't exist and then comparing it to the language with that word. Uh, you get two different manifold shapes and relative homology allows you to compute the difference between the shapes of those manifolds. So basically it allows me to see how uh, that particular word contributed uh, to the overall shape of the manifold. Um, so it turns out that different classes of words tend to have different uh, shape complexities. Uh, further, furthermore, uh, you can use those features to distinguish classes of words. So you can use uh, homology theory to uh, look at just the vector embeddings of words and uh, tell that they are different types of words, that they carry different type of information. Um, we defined something called perforation, which is a, a kind of L2 norm of a persistence interval. The way this works is uh, I feed it uh, a corpus of uh, natural language text, uh, I feed it to this uh, neural language model, and I get a point cloud in some high dimensional vector space. Then <clears throat> I'm I take this point cloud as input to the next part of the analysis. Uh, I expand a neighborhood around each point and obtain this kind of uh, complex from it. Then I apply homology theory to this complex to obtain um, persistence intervals for different topological features in that space. In the end, I can summarize it as the magnitude of this persistence interval, this uh, persistence diagram, and I get some kind of uh, uh, number. So some results, uh, just highlight some basic results at the end. Um, there, there are different ways of uh, implementing language models based on convolutional architectures, recurrent neural network self-attention. Uh, however, we 
observe that there's a part of the shape of the manifold that's independent of the architecture. So it's really dictated by the grammar of the language. Um, furthermore, if you look at time evolution of how, um, how those manifolds evolve over time, when you train a neural network, that there tends to be some um, region of shapes that it tends to. And we can use this as an early stopping criterion for language models. So we know when the language model starts overfitting by looking at the shape of the representations. Uh, <clears throat> and um, another area that is, I'm currently uh, exploring and performing experiments on this is uh, looking at embeddings of language as morphemes and then embeddings of words from morphemes and then comparing the shape of the morpheme space to the shape of the word space. And, uh, what I observed is there is some natural alignment between those two manifolds. Uh, that tells me that the morphological analysis is correct. So uh, at the end, the future directions for this, um, uh, <clears throat> we can use this for model compression, so we can reparameterize those neural networks to compress the model. Uh, we can use it to classify lang languages and linguistic phenomena. Uh, and. Uh, there are other homology theories for persistence, like multidimensional persistence, which I haven't tried yet. Um, and finally, exploring the homology of models themselves. So classifying the data sets and classifying the models that work best with different data sets. Thank you.